Okay, what we're going to do is continue on in our study uh, through divorce and remarriage, and uh, we're going to set it up a certain way to where we kind of show our trajectory and how I think we should look at these texts uh, in terms of our methodology. So let's begin first in a word of prayer. Father, again, we come to your word humbly, wanting to know what is true and willing to love what is true. Uh, even if it corrects our traditional ideas, uh, corrects our modern ideas, whatever it may correct, Lord. I I pray that we are willing to glorify you, to exalt you by exalting you on a throne of truth, your truth that you revealed in your word. And we exalt you not only by acknowledging its truth, but also seeking to live out what you have spoken. We know that is the best, Lord, even though we have different ideas of what is best. We know that what you've commanded is best, what you've taught is best. And so we seek now the best in order to glorify you, not only in word, but also in deed. Father, we thank you so much for loving us enough to speak these truths to us, uh, that you might rightly order the world through us uh, by rightly ordering our families and rightly ordering our marriages and our ideas of marriage. Lord, we just thank you once again in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so what I want to do is kind of show the methodology that I think is important to use, and that is uh, the idea that you set up the texts that talk about divorce and remarriage in chronological order. And that way you can kind of see what is the teaching and how is it being molded uh, to the specific audience. Now, Each person that talks about what the Lord says about divorce and remarriage will mold it to their audience. And you'll you'll see that, that there's a transition of different terms or there's, uh, you know, like Matthew's exceptions or whatever. He's molding it to the audience so that the audience understands what Christ is commanding. And we'll talk more about this as we go along. So I think what's really important to understand is, again, You go with the earliest and the clearest teaching, and from there, you put everything into that context. Now, you might say, well, that contradicts what you said before because you said you should go to the New Testament first and not the Old. Well, that's not what I mean. I don't mean we're going to the Old Testament first because the Old Testament clearly has times when God uh, concedes to the culture in order to teach them other truths. Uh, But the New Testament is the fullest revelation, and now that the Spirit has come, now that the New Age has come, God requires the fullest of obedience. So there's nothing in the New Testament, like in the Old, where God is just conceding things. This is important. Some people have that hermeneutic, where even in the New Testament, they think, well, God's just kind of making concessions, but it's not ideally what he wants. And so you'll have people argue like, well, God just kind of conceded to the roles of men and women, but ultimately wants, you know, uh, egalitarianism, which is convenient for the Enlightenment, which is all about egalitarianism. Um, uh, God conceded at the time that things like homosexuality were wrong. But now that we've understood, you know, we've developed our understanding of, of what homosexuality is and all that, then now it's, it's okay. Or or God conceded to slavery at the time, and now we understand that slavery is bad. And of course, we've talked about slavery before, uh, how it's more like a welfare issue, it's a mercy issue, and that it's not talking about the type of slavery that was practiced in America or around the West for, or in the world for that matter, for the past uh, 400 years. Uh, That slavery is condemned in the Bible, early on, back in the Book of the Covenant. So uh, this hermeneutic that, well, even the New Testament concedes to certain ideas is not true, which means then we can go back to the earliest uh, saying of what Jesus has said and consider it the fullest revelation. That doesn't mean that we can't understand it further. It just means that if Jesus says something, it's not a concession. It's not something to be added to or taken away from. Um, It can be simply applied and it can be understood in certain contexts to be saying this and not that or whatever, but it has to be understood as this is the fullness of revelation. So I think this is the way it goes. We have approximately six statements made uh, in the Bible about divorce and remarriage. There's in Mark, Luke, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, Romans 7, uh, um, Matthew 5, and Matthew 19. 
So I think pretty much the way I just laid them out is the chronological order of those things. I believe Mark is written first. I believe Paul uses Mark. There's a lot of he alludes to Mark quite a bit um, in his writings. He uses vocabulary that's unique to only him and Mark. Uh, so I don't think it's just a cue, the source. I don't think it's just a tradition. I think Mark is actually written. Uh, then after Mark comes 1 Corinthians 7. And after 1 Corinthians 7 comes Romans 7. After Romans 7, you have Luke, I believe. And then I believe Matthew is the last written of the Synoptic Gospels. And so whatever Matthew says, that is the exception that it makes, it needs to be put in the context of what is said before. What the church has as its fullest revelation uh, the absolute truth on an issue, it needs to be put in that context rather than vice versa, and we'll talk more about that as we go along. So let's begin first with Mark chapter 10, uh, starting in verse 1. Then Jesus left that place and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan River. Again, crowds gathered to him, and again, as was his custom, he taught them. Then some Pharisees came to test him, and they asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, He wrote this commandment for you because of your hard hearts. But from the beginning of creation, he made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, no one is to separate. In the house again, the disciples asked him about this. So he told them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another uh, woman commits adultery against her. And if she, having divorced her husband, marries another man, she commits adultery. Now, here's the first statement I think we have of Christ making uh, this comment about divorce and remarriage. It should be understood that divorce is pretty much practiced in Jewish culture. Uh, it, it's not really practiced maybe in the Qumran community, in the Dead Sea Scrolls or whatever. Uh, it's, it's outlawed there. Uh, it, divorce and remarriage is wrong. But in the main community of Judaism, it's practiced pretty much quite a bit. Uh, there was a split in schools uh, between the school of Shammai and the school of Hillel. Uh, whether those schools are as rigid or not, I mean, we'll talk about this a little bit later. But the, the idea was at least you could divorce for adultery uh, and that uh, in the Hillelite school, you could divorce for all sorts of things. I mean, uh, uh, even if she like maybe burned your food or something, I mean, it was just anything of that nature. And they're all interpreting Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. Uh, in, in 24, 1, I believe, it's, it talks about if there's a, a matter of nakedness, and the matter of nakedness is then interpreted to be any sort of uh, unclean thing, anything that's revealed uh, by Hillel, versus the matter of nakedness is, re is adultery by Shammai. We'll talk about whether that's a legitimate interpretation of, of Deuteronomy 24 later on. But this is the background. Uh, divorce and remarriage is common either for adultery, usually just for any cause uh, at all, but at least for adultery. <clears throat> now, I want you to notice how the passage kind of forms. In Mark, the Pharisees come to Jesus and they want to test him. So they already know that maybe he has a view that's going to shock people. And they want everyone to see it. You know, you, you kind of have these people in the church today as well. It's like, oh, well, listen to what this guy says about this. He's crazy. I mean, listen to this guy's uh, idea. So that, that's why they're testing him. They're not testing him in terms of knowing that he holds a particular view that basically is what other people believe. That, then no one's going to be shocked by it. No one's going to stop following him because of it. Their goal is to get people to stop following him by showing, look, this guy believes crazy things. This is why they come up to him uh, at one point and uh, they're trying to get him you know, to say something about Caesar and taxes and all that. They're trying to get the people angry so they don't follow him anymore. Or they're trying to get him in trouble with Caesar. 
So the same thing here. They know, they must have heard that he's teaching. From Matthew, we see that there's two spots that he's teaching it. And itinerant preachers tended to repeat their, their teachings, obviously. Jesus just didn't say one thing one place, and then he went somewhere else, and then it's like, oh, I'm going to teach you something different. I mean, he may have added to his teaching, but he's, he's teaching these same things over and over again. Um, and so uh, they probably heard it, and now they want the rest of the people, hey, you got to hear what this guy says about this crazy, crazy thing. And so they come to him and they ask him the question, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? So he wants to see, well, how are you reading Moses? What do you think about that commandment? They said Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of dismissal, a certificate of divorce, and to divorce her. So as long as you wrote the certificate and you divorced her, you were allowed to divorce her. But Jesus said to him, or said to them, He wrote this commandment for you because of your hard hearts. But from the beginning of creation, he made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and the two will become one flesh. Now, Jesus adds there to the creation account and says the two will become one flesh. He's he's, uh, getting what's implied there that there's Adam and Eve and that there's two there. Uh, the, the account actually says a man will leave his father and mother and cling to his wife. There's nothing about two becoming uh, one. Um, the, they, they'll become one flesh in that passage, but there's only two uh, in Jesus' interpretation of it. So the two become one flesh, meaning then it's exclusive. Marriage is exclusive. There is no, and this also negates the idea of polygamy, that polygamy is legitimate. Um, divorce and remarriage, therefore, is not legitimate because you're only to have two become one flesh. And you'll see that in his conclusion. So he says in verse 15, so they are no longer two but one, I'm sorry, in verse eight, so they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, no one is to separate. So, and that word separation is the word for divorce. What, what God has joined together, that is in what God has put together in the one flesh union from the two, no one, no man, no human being is to therefore divorce. There's the clear teaching. Are you supposed to get a divorce? No. That's clear. God has joined two together. No one is to divorce. That's the statement. No human is to divorce what God has joined together. That's the point. Now, I want you to notice, uh, he he says uh, in the house, again, the disciples come or whatever, and he tells them more explicitly then what happens if someone does divorce and then remarry, because typically people are divorcing to remarry, right? Very few people are divorcing, saying, you know, I'm just going to live a single the rest of my life and never marry again. Usually people think, well, I can find somebody better. So there's kind of even adultery in the very idea that they want to divorce someone. Verse 11, so he told them, whoever divorces his wife, whosoever is the terminology, whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman, it's feminine there, marries another, the, the, the word another there is feminine, commits adultery against her, whoever, whoever it may be. And that's the man. And then Mark includes, because he's, he's got a Roman audience, he concludes what I think is something extra. I don't think Jesus is saying it originally. I think Mark is applying it now to women because in Roman culture, women can divorce men. In, in uh, ancient Israel, in, in ancient Judea, they cannot uh, so women cannot divorce men. So you're gonna. The, the original saying probably is not uh, that women. If women do it as well, Mark is applying this for his gospel, as the other gospel writers will apply it in different ways, as we'll see, uh, to his audience. So he says in verse twelve, and if she divorces her husband and marries another man, again that's masculine now, she commits adultery. So either way, whoever does the divorcing and marries another commits adultery. Very important. 
This is an absolute statement. There is no exception given here. It's not, you know, except in this case and in that case. And, well, you know, you can get divorced and remarried for that. And other, No, listen to what is said. God has joined two together. No human is allowed to divorce. That's it. No human can declare that it's divorce. No human is to do it. It's illegal in the eyes of God to divorce. It's an absolute statement. And so he says another absolute statement, whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery, period. No exception. That is the teaching that the early church got. That's the teaching that Paul is going to get. And so Paul is going to interpret the Lord from Mark. And I want you to notice how he interprets the Lord in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Starting in verse 10. To the married, I give this command. Not I, but the Lord. Now, when Paul does this, not I, but the Lord, and not the Lord, but me, or whatever, he's not saying, this is my opinion, uh, and now that now it's not my opinion, but now it is my opinion, and it's not the Lord's what the Lord said. He's referring to what the Lord said in his earthly ministry from the Gospel of Mark. So he's saying the Lord taught about this. The Lord didn't teach about this, but I'm going to give you a commandment based on what the Lord has said. That is in Mark. So you are getting a divine Holy Spirit inspired interpretation of the Gospel of Mark. What does Jesus mean by all of this? Does he really mean that you cannot divorce and remarry? And the answer is going to be, yeah. And you might say, well, but this commentator says this, and I read this book here, and it's like, yeah, who cares? Are they inspired by the Holy Spirit? You actually have an interpretation here of Mark right here. Here's the interpretation of what the Lord has said. That's why he says, not I, but the Lord. This is coming from what the Lord had said in his earthly ministry. To the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to divorce a husband. There's the command. But if she does, for some reason, she didn't hear the words of the Lord, something happened, she separates for some reason, let her either remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. So both of them there. Remember, that's what Mark says. Mark has both, remember? Both the husband divorcing the wife and the wife divorcing the husband and marrying another. Paul has both here. Not all of the sayings have both of those. Paul has them here because, again, he's interpreting Mark. So very important to understand this, that you have an apostolic commentary telling you that what Jesus meant is you are not to divorce another person, period. If for some reason you did not obey that, for some reason you got divorced, for some reason you were separated, say crazy circumstances or whatever, you are not to get remarried, ever. Either you remain unmarried, agamas, or you are to be reconciled to your spouse. Those are your two options. The end. Again, is that clear? Yes. That's the clear part of 1 Corinthians 7. Matthew or Mark 10 was clear. 1 Corinthians 7, 10 through 11 is clear. Now, he's going to go on and talk about, well, what, because Jesus is addressing two believers, right? I mean, Uh, And so he's going to go on to to address the situation of a believer with an unbeliever. And even then he's going to argue that you're not to divorce the unbeliever as long as they're not divorcing you. I mean, you can let them go if they divorce you, he says, but you're not to divorce them. And the, the rule still would apply. You're not to get remarried because, again, the principle is the two become one flesh from Mark. Therefore, you're not if you marry uh, while the person lives, you're committing adultery. Now, if you think that that's not the right conclusion from 10 and 11 and Mark, I would ask you to go down 1 Corinthians 7 as Paul ends his whole letter, or I'm sorry, his whole uh, pericope here 
by making just that statement. In verse 39, a wife is bound as long as her husband is living. But if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes only in the Lord. That is, she's only free to marry a believer, but she can marry any believer she wants, any believing man she wants. Notice that she's bound. Deo, that's the, the marriage bond, the word that Paul uses for the marriage bond. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, that's when she's free to marry whoever in the Lord. So again, is that clear? Yeah, it's pretty clear. There doesn't seem anything ambiguous about it. Now, there are ambiguities in the rest of the text that we'll come back to these texts and we'll look at them more in detail. But I want you to notice at the get-go, here's the clear teaching that Paul is getting from the Lord's teaching in Mark. Romans 7, he's going to repeat this. Now, this is an analogy, and people will often say, well, it's an analogy, so you can't really include it. But the problem is, is that if, if what Paul says about divorce and remarriage are in terms of death and uh, the exceptions or whatever is not true, then what he says about the law and us is not true. Like the whole point is that a death is needed so that we then are no longer obligated to the law uh, for justification, um, if there's some other way to where we don't have to die through Christ, then his analogy is false. So he's going to make the argument that you have to die in order to be free to then remarry, to enter, enter into a new covenant, that idea. So chapter seven, or do you not know brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is Lord over a person as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband as long as he lives, just like the law. As long as you live, you're bound to the law. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. So then if she is joined to another man while her husband is alive, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law. And if she is joined to another man, she is not an adulteress. So my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ so that you could be joined to another, to the one who has been raised from the dead to bear fruit to God. So the analogy is somebody's got to die. And then Paul kind of mixes it up here because it's like, you know, husband dying, but then you're dying or whatever to be free. But the, the point is, is that there needs to be a death in order to break the obligation to the other. So you're married in this covenant that is to the law and then that has to be broken in terms for justification. Obviously, we, we still uh, look to the law to love the Lord and love one another and to guide us in that way. But the point is, is for justification, uh, you need to die according to the law in order to no longer be bound to it. Because that's the penalty of the law as well. Through Christ, we die to the law. And now we're free to enter into the new covenant with God, to be married to Christ as his church and to become holy and actually bear fruit because we're now in a relationship with God, uh, having died to the law. So a death needs to take place in order to become unbound is the idea. Well, if that's true, then the analogy needs to be true that a death must take place in order to be unbound from your partner. Again, this is Paul's interpretation of Mark. You see it in 1 Corinthians 7, and now you see it here. And so it's clear then, no exceptions, no exceptions here, no exceptions in 1 Corinthians 7, although we can go back and talk about how people try to make exceptions when it comes to unbeliever, but we'll, we'll talk about that. No exceptions in Mark. Let's go to the next one, Luke. Luke chapter 16. Luke's is very brief. Uh, it's just in verse 18. Everyone who divorces his wife, and this is everyone, so it's actually the word uh, uh, pas here. So uh, pas ha apoluon. Uh, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another, um, yeah, an another woman, uh, commits adultery. So everyone who divorces his wife, everyone talking about the male there, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery. And notice this. Now Luke is going to now mold this and apply what Jesus has said originally to his audience to let them know it's not just the husband involved in the divorce 
and the wife involved in the divorce who's committing adultery if there's remarriage, but it's also the man who marries her. So, and the one who marries a woman who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. Why? Because she's still one flesh. So notice Luke then, Luke doesn't have any of that one flesh stuff, but he's functioning off of it what Paul says and what uh, uh, Mark says, what Jesus says in Mark, that the two become one flesh. Why is he committing adultery? Because he's marrying a woman who is still one flesh with a man who already made a covenant commitment and is one flesh with them in marriage. So so a woman who is already still bound to the man, he is now joining with her and committing adultery because she's still bound to the man. She may not be legally married because she got a piece of paper, but over and over again, Jesus is basically saying, and all uh, all the apostles are saying, the piece of paper doesn't matter. The piece of paper doesn't do anything. Your registry in the law that you're no longer married means nothing. You are bound in the eyes of God as one flesh to someone you made a marital commitment to. You had a covenant. It was sealed in the consummation of that covenant, and therefore it cannot be dissolved. Even though we may recognize that legally on a human side it's dissolved to people and you consider yourself married to someone else or what have you that is an adulterous thing that you did uh now we'll we'll talk about whether god wants you to keep your oaths and all that and whether you should like you know divorce the person you're married to now or what we'll talk about all of that but for now it's important to understand this is the clear teaching of the entire new testament before you get to matthew And it's wrong to then take Matthew and try to bulldoze all of it. When Matthew is ambiguous, the whole parektos uh, in the case of uh, uh, Pornea, to try to bulldoze all the teaching that they just had and that the, the apostles have been teaching the church. Obviously, Paul just taught the Corinthians, you cannot get a divorce. If you are divorced, you're to remain unmarried or reconciled to your spouse. He just taught that to the church. So we know what the apostles are teaching the church. So either you have to conclude that Matthew is contradicting everyone and saying, oh, no, you can actually dissolve a marriage in certain cases. Or you have to read Matthew and understand that Matthew might be talking about something else other than a legitimate marriage. Uh, He may be referring to something else. And most scholars... uh, Well, I won't say most scholars. A lot of scholars, maybe half of them, understand that he's saying something else. The other half just go with the fact that he's contradicting. That he's he's contradicting because maybe he sees the original command as too harsh. These are people who don't believe necessarily in the inerrancy of the Bible, that the Bible's coherent and whatnot. That's why you get a differing opinion in scholars. But they will say Matthew is contradicting Mark and Luke. Now, some of them will try to make it, well, well, maybe there's not a full contradiction because you can understand the originals is maybe not as tight. But in reality, the the original statements are absolute. And most scholars will note that. They're absolute statements, even regardless of what they believe. Some scholars, they don't follow Christianity at all, so they don't care. They don't have a vested interest in it. So they're just like, yeah, Jesus taught that it was absolute. Matthew changed it. We don't come to the scripture that way. So we actually think what Matthew is doing somehow must be put in the framework of you cannot divorce a legitimate marriage, you cannot dissolve it, and you cannot be remarried. You can only be reconciled to your spouse. So somehow Matthew fits into that. And so when we go to Matthew, we're, we're looking at him in that context rather than looking at all this teaching and trying to change it because of what Matthew says. So let's go. Matthew 5. This is the first time that he mentions it. Matthew 5, chapter 31. It was said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. That's the, uh, uh, the apostasy on. Um, but I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for Pornea, makes her commit adultery. And whoever divorces a divorced woman commits adultery. So there you have against the man who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. But also here you've got an added element that the man actually makes the woman commit adultery because she might have to get remarried 
for some reason. And so he's making her commit adultery. So he's actually still participating in adultery, even if he remains unmarried, just by divorcing the woman and kind of forcing her into another marriage. So everybody's guilty, basically. And you'll have commentators make this statement that no one's innocent. No one's the innocent party in a divorce in terms of if this guy divorces, uh, this woman remarries, this guy then marries a woman and is divorced, they're all guilty. Now, we have an exception there, but it's ambiguous. What does pornea mean? We don't, we don't know. Um, let's go to Matthew 19, and then we'll maybe discuss it a little bit. We're not going to discuss what pornea is today. We'll do that another time. I just want you to know the hermeneutic and how you interpret this, regardless of what pornea might mean. Chapter 19, verse 1. Now, when Jesus finished these sayings, he left Galilee and went to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan River. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Then some Pharisees came to him in order to test him. They asked, is it lawful to divorce a wife for any cause? Now, even that translation, I want you to notice, is not necessarily correct. It could be, is there any reason that you can divorce a spouse, or can you divorce a spouse for any reason? It could be either one of those. He answered, have you not read from the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be united with his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, no human is to separate slash divorce. So there you've got an absolute statement by Jesus. Matthew records the absolute statement. No one is to get a divorce. God has joined two people together. No human is to make some statement saying otherwise. The two have come together. He's made them one. They're no longer two. You can separate two things. You can't separate one thing. One thing is one thing. Uh, Two things can be separated. And so that's why he says, consequently, they're no longer two, but they're one. You cannot separate them. And therefore, what God has put together, no human being is to divorce it, to separate it, to act like it can be two again. It's not. So that's the absolute statement. Matthew includes that there so you know this is what Jesus actually teaches. I want you also to notice that Matthew flips Mark a little bit to where originally the Pharisees are asking him the question and Jesus says, you know, what did Moses command you? Here, the, the, he presents the Pharisees as having an objection to what Jesus has said. So they say, they said to him in verse 7, Why then did Moses command us to give a certificate of dismissal, that is a certificate of divorce, and to divorce her? So I, I want you to notice there that they're objecting to what Jesus has just said. Jesus gave an absolute statement. And they're saying, wait a minute, why did Moses command us that we could actually get a divorce then? As long as we gave her a certificate of divorce, then we could, we could divorce her. They're not arguing, wait, well, wait, wait, uh, Moses said we get a divorce for this reason or that reason or the other reason. They're arguing now that they, they can get a divorce for any reason now. Like, wait, wait a minute, Moses said we could divorce, though. We're just asking you for what reason. And Jesus is saying, yeah, there is no reason. The two become one flesh. No one's to get a divorce, what God's put together. Well, now they're going to say, so, so Matthew himself is ordering it so that you know, Jesus is still making the absolute statement. And the Pharisees are arguing with the absolute statement. I want you to notice Jesus' response to them is that, whoa, whoa, guys, you misunderstood me. I am saying that Moses was right, and, and there's reasons that you can get a divorce. So like adultery, you can, you can get a divorce for adultery. It's no problem. Did you not hear me? No, his statement is, no, Moses wrote it because of the hardness of your hearts. Um, that's why. And so in verse eight, Jesus said to them, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of your hard hearts. But from the beginning, it was not this way. So it was not meant for you to ever divorce your wife. That's not what God wanted. That's not what the two flesh un- one, the two uh, to one flesh union means. And so he says in verse nine, "Now I say to you, as opposed to what you've, in- you've understood, what Moses is saying, now I say to you that whoever divorces his wife, except for pornea, and marries another woman, commits adultery." 
Now notice how the disciples respond. The disciples said to him, whoa, basically they're saying, if this is the case of a husband with a wife, it's better not to marry at all. Now notice that their response should be, oh, well, as long as there's a way out through like adultery or something like that. Or, no, but because there is no way out, if in fact you're, the relationship between two people is a way that where they're not going to stick together, it's better they don't get married. And Jesus doesn't say, no, no, you have it all wrong. I'm, 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 you misunderstand what I'm saying. No, he says, uh, not everyone can accept this statement except to those who has been, it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were made that way from birth, and some were made eunuchs by others, and some who become eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. That is, they become single and celibate for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who is able to accept this should accept it. So I want you to notice, whatever Matthew is saying, it's still absolute. The audience understands it as absolute in terms of legitimate marriage, which means that it's the same teaching as before, all throughout the same teaching, and that in fact, what the way we should interpret it then is that the exception has to do with something that's an illegitimate marriage. Either it's a marriage that has not been consummated to where the two become one flesh yet, as a consummation of the covenant made, or it's an illegitimate marriage in that it's something like an incestuous marriage or a sexually immoral marriage. One of those two things as an illegitimate marriage. Now we'll discuss this more next week when we talk, we talk about what the nature of pornea might be. Um, but it's important to understand that before we ever do that, what is open to us in the interpretation of what pornea means in terms of the exception is not, yeah, Jesus lets you to divorce and remarry sometimes when you have a legitimate consummated marriage. Uh, no, that's not an option because now you're contradicting the entire teaching of the New Testament. So you're not allowed to divorce and remarry for those reasons. So that even when you get the early church interpretation by the fathers and the, for the first 1500 years, the idea that you can get a divorce, even they see in that that really it's not a real divorce. You're just kind of separating with the hope of reconciliation, but you are not allowed to remarry. Because that part is clear. In fact, when you read a lot of the commentaries, I was reading Davies and Allison last night, their commentary on Matthew. It's the Inter International Critical Commentary. And he was just like, we're not sure. Uh, it doesn't, we're not sure if you actually can get remarried or not. Or if you're just not allowed to divorce, uh, we're not sure. I mean, it, the, the amount of, of just uncertainty is amazing because in the, in, the, in the end, it's actually pretty clear, but it does in fact go against uh, our modern culture and what we want to believe, that you can in fact get, get remarried if you divorce. When the clear teaching of the New Testament seems to be, no, you can't, and it shouldn't be muddied by the ambiguities that are stated and said the ambiguities, again, hermeneutically, should be interpreted in light of the clear, not vice versa. But we're not doing that because we wanted to say something else. We're not interpreting the ambiguity in terms of the clear because we want the ambiguous there because it opens a door so that we can do what we want and we can believe what we want and we can have what we want because the other seems too harsh. I want you to notice the other seems harsh to everyone. That's why the Pharisees react this way. They're like, whoa, 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 what do you mean? Moses said we can get a divorce. We're just asking you the reason. And Jesus is like, no, if you do this, you're committing adultery. And the disciples are like, whoa, 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 whoa. Then in that case, you shouldn't get married at all. If you even have an inkling that you might get a divorce and remarried. And Jesus says, yeah, that's right. You got it. Uh, and, you know, for those who can accept it, they should actually follow that because you don't want to be committing adultery. God is an avenger of adultery, as Hebrews says. Uh, he will damn adulterers and those who can commit pornea as well. Notice pornea as well. Again, we'll talk about that next week. So that's my point is that ultimately the way you interpret Matthew, I, I think shows whether you're really going to be teachable to the scripture. Because if you're interpreting Matthew a particular way to go against all the other teaching in the New Testament that's clear, then you can rest assured you're doing that because you want it to say something else. 
besides what it actually says when you read the clear. You're wanting it to read differently, probably because you want to do something differently, probably because you want to advise people differently, probably because you don't want to see people in a certain way who may be divorced and remarried. Again, we'll talk about this too. You don't have to then go around and judge everyone who's divorced and remarried, people who didn't know it, people, whatever. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about all of this. But in the time being, don't let your biblical interpretation be dictated by what you want to be true. And I'm telling you right now, if you're interpreting the clear in light of the ambiguous, you are interpreting it so that you get something that you want to be true, not what actually is true according to the clear teaching in the scripture. And let's not go about and be like, well, God's not clear. I guess he can't communicate well. No, God is clear, and it's our interpretation and our skills and interpretation that are off when we're muddying what's clear with it, what's ambiguous. God expects you to actually follow language rules correctly. That's why he's using language. And so he means for you to actually look at the clear and interpret the ambiguous in light of it. He never meant for you to look at the ambiguous and make all the clear very muddy so you really don't know what's being said. Or that you try to contradict the clear with it and be like, well, maybe that's just all hyperbole. Does it sound like hyperbole in Paul? Not really. It didn't sound like hyperbole originally with Jesus. And it didn't sound like hyperbole to the original audience because they are freaked out by it. They think it's crazy. Are you kidding me? I mean, at least Shammai held that you could get a divorce and remarried for like adultery. And so we see then that, look, the original audience, Paul himself, uh, everyone who reads the clear has the understanding that, no, you cannot get divorced and remarried for any reason. God has put the, the marriage relationship together. The two, it's been consummated. The two have become one flesh. That's it. So if any man divorces that, he's going against the will of God. And he's saying something that isn't true. He's saying that your marriage is dissolved when it's not dissolved in the eyes of God. You're still one flesh. And while your spouse lives, you will be committing adultery if you are joined to another. Now, let's be clear. The idea is that you marry another because the idea is that you're not going to be like a, a whore or something. But let, let's be really clear that if you're promiscuous, you're not allowed to do that either. It's not like, well, I'm not going to marry another, but I'm going to go sleep around. <coughs> um, you're not permitted to be joined. And all of it's adultery. All of it's adultery. That's the whole point. You're being joined to another person who's not your spouse. So if you do that, you're committing adultery. It's like, well, I'm not legally married. It doesn't matter. Did you pay attention to what was said? God joined together. No man has the authority to say that you're not married. No man has the authority to say you're divorced. No man has the authority to say that your marriage is dissolved. It's not dissolved. Now, you may have made another oath. Again, that's something we'll talk about later. But as for understanding whether or not if you're in a marriage or you've even been divorced, that somehow you can remarry, you cannot. That's the clear teaching, as radical as it might be. Because that's not what Westminster taught you. Because that's not what your church taught you. Because that's not what, you know, all these other teachers in evangelicalism taught you. Evangelicalism just adopts the party line. It inherits what the reformers say. That's why it's a big mess. Uh, some people inherit the more conservative position, which would have been the more liberal position to Jesus that you can get divorced and remarried on the basis of adultery or abandonment. That would have been considered liberal here. In fact, they would have responded being like, oh yeah, that sounds, that sounds about right. Um, that's the more conservative position. Actually, it's a little bit more liberal than the mo more conservative position, but they had heard it. They're familiar with it. In fact, I would argue the Pharisees here are actually of the school of Shammai that Jesus is talking to. The Pharisees that you know, represent maybe the people that Matthew are talking to or maybe the Hillelites. But either way, it doesn't really matter because uh, it shows a shock among both them and the disciples who would have actually heard this position before. They wouldn't have been shocked by it. If Jesus was just saying, yeah, I, I agree with Shammai, 
then they would have been like, oh, okay, well, there's, there's the reason for divorce. Again, the Pharisees are arguing, but Moses said we could get a divorce. They're not arguing over the reasons anymore because they understand Jesus to be saying, there's no reason. There's no reason given at all. God has put it together. No man has the right to actually divorce. Moses did that, not because there's a reason for you to get a divorce. Moses wrote you that because you're stubborn and you have a hard heart and you were going to actually divorce. And so he needed to protect the woman, which is really what, about, uh, what that law is about. It's about protecting the woman who is unjustly divorced. Again, we'll talk about all that when we go over uh, Deuteronomy 24. Anyway, uh, that's what I wanted to talk about tonight. I wanted to kind of just do this overview of the text, show you the way in which you should interpret them, the framework in which you should interpret them, not interpreting Matthew to contradict, because it would contradict. It doesn't just add to it. It's not just like, oh, well, here's an exception, though, that wasn't before. If it's absolute and you have Paul saying no one's to get a divorce, no one's absolutely to get remarried— then it seems obvious that to say, oh, but you can get a divorce for this reason is contradictory. What it has to be is that what Matthew was saying is that, no, I agree with all of that. You cannot get a legitimate divorce. That's clear from the passage in Matthew 19 itself. But there's an exception that doesn't have to do with a legitimate marriage being dissolved where it's consummated. Um, correctly between a man and a woman. So we'll, we'll talk about that as we uh, discuss the nature of porneia and the exception clauses next week. Uh, for now, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is clear, although we would love it to be muddied when it's not saying something that we like and something we agree with. I, I know there probably, will probably be a lot of hostile reaction to even this statement, but again, there was hostile reaction to the Lord's original statement. And so we just ask that you would open the eyes of your people to hear your truth, to want to believe your truth and to love your truth so as to teach it and to live it out, uh, that they might come to a place where they glorify you and understand that that's what all of this is about. It's not about trying to find our greatest fulfillment and happiness and pleasure in marriage. It is seeking to glorify you in marriage uh, by being obedient and understanding that we are two that become one flesh uh, to reflect all sorts of things, all sorts of pictures, but also for the sake of children as well that has been often lost uh, in our modern culture. We thank you, Lord, for this word because we know that it's creational. It orders the family, and therefore, through it, it orders the world. Help your church to be an ordering creational people and not join the side of chaos uh, in, in adopting views that are chaotic and will lead to further chaos in the world. Lord, we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.